testing, testing, one, two, three. Okay, um, welcome to this podcast. Uh, in this podcast, I'd like to talk about the placement of the moon in Leo. Now, a friend of mine has been talking about this particular placement for a while. And I told her that when the time was right, I would uh, release the uh, recorded copy of the podcast. So I'm just adding this uh, top layer to the podcast itself, which I've recorded since, you know, I think two years now. I just haven't released it because I like to time these things. You know, astrologers understand, probably understand why. Um, so... This is part of the Luna series, you know, I've, I have about six or seven of the podcasts r- referring to the moon in different signs. And um, if you are interested, after listening to this podcast, that is, if you're interested in having a natal chart synthesis done, then my details are always in the video description. Uh, links to my website where you can actually make a booking or reg- and register your interest. Um... I also offer classes where I teach uh, how to conduct natal chart synthesis, you know, six classes, and I teach them as online lectures now. But they're different if you want live sessions with the online lectures, then it's a bit more expensive that way. Um, So if you listen to any of my podcasts on astrology and it resonates with you and you feel like getting deeper insight into your reading, or even learning about astrology in a way that is quite different from um, the the way it is taught, generally speaking, because I, I'm, I do not consider myself an astrologer, so to speak. I, I wouldn't know what that means if I didn't come from a physics background in terms of why does astrology work, you know, what does it all mean and how, because you have to understand that behavior is something that emerges from the way that the brain is wired. The wiring of that brain is not random. It's responding to much deeper rules, which ultimately lead you to physics and the laws of nature. All right? Because what you're going to deal with when you begin to look at the the brain is biochemistry. And then you go deeper, you get to basic, just ordinary chemistry, molecules and all that. And then you dig deeper and you get into the physics of it all. And you dig deeper and you get into mathematics. That's why my... The title of my service of my book is the five principles of organized complexity because organized complexity is a very deep concept it's a much deeper concept than astrology than any science you can think of because every science every study if it is true can be reduced to the study of organized complexity and that's why i wrote my book on organized complexity the aim is to go to the very source of all knowledge all understanding and show how all of it is linked together into oneness because at the end of the day it is not complexity that is the intriguing thing really it's simplicity and this is something from uh, the collapse of chaos a book uh, written by ian stewart and jack cohen so at the end of the day If you're going to study astrology as something that is true, not as a religion, because I don't do all that. If you're going to study it and you're going to back it up with truth, meaning that it is based on first principles, you know, on on the physics of the whole thing, then you're going to have to go very deep. Because modern science, at least in the mainstream, does not understand where the mind, the human mind comes from. Self-consciousness and things like that. All right? So... Talk less of describing how behavior emerges. Now, astrology makes a very big claim. It says that, uh, you know, by looking at symbolic patterns regarding the movements of the solar system, that we can begin to delineate behavior. These are huge claims, claims that are dismissed by mainstream science. And they dismiss it because you cannot prove it. That is, if you do not belong to the five principles of organized complexity. From the perspective of the five principles of organized complexity, you have proof. That's really what it is. And every day the proof becomes even more detailed. All right? Because a human being emerges from something. You don't just, you're not just some type of random fluctuation in the world. No. The thing about truth is this. Once you can narrow down truth in a very small area, then you can extend that truth to every area. It's unlike, very unlike the way modern science is studied today. You know, modern science arrives at some type of answer or some type of resolution so to speak or some type of consensus 
And then three years later, they overturned the whole thing and threw it away and built something else. Now, I'm not saying that this is bad. I'm just saying that that is the nature of the method itself. All right? So you never really know anything for sure in terms of it can all be overturned tomorrow. And the aim of the five principles of organized complexity is to overturn everything. It has to be overturned because it's not true. Now, there's various snippets of truth, but like I said, truth is something that connects naturally to everything else, everywhere else. Truth can never exist in isolation. That's not the way it works. The nature of truth is connection, and that's where the sixes come in. That's why when you open my page, <laughs> my web page, you see three sixes blazing there. It's not right. I'm not, I didn't write it because of some type of biblical reference or whatever. I don't do all that. It's there because it represents the deepest principle in physical existence. The nature of truth. How it connects together. Because without those connections, you and I won't be here. There'd be nothing. There'd be no life. There'd be nothing. Life exists because of those connections. And the ability of those connections to find themselves is what you call chemistry. When those connections find themselves in ways that recycle that's when you have biochemistry because that is the origin of life that's really what it is everything else is just semantics and six is black six is blackness whenever it appears whenever those anywhere those connections are establishing organized complexity that area is always black doesn't matter what, what you call it. You can call it carbon. You can call it melanin. You can call it whatever you want to call it is not important. And so the sixes represent the physics of blackness. It is a physics of connection. Now, it doesn't matter if you call it graphene, graphite, nano, carbon, or whatever you want to call it. It is based on the physics of blackness, which means that it is based on the most efficient packing and transport system conceivable. And every time that physics is enacted anywhere, you see it as black. There's a reason for that. The nature of the connection is blackness. It doesn't matter what hue your skin is. It doesn't matter what pigment your skin is. It doesn't matter what the races tell you. It does nothing, none of those things matter. Blackness runs your consciousness. The only language that nature understands is intelligence. And if what's going on in your head does not correspond to the intelligence that nature is talking about, then you go extinct. That's how it works. And like I said, when you have to extend truth to all areas, even though you start from a very small place, truth is by virtue of what it is, something that you can extend to every area. And if that blackness represents that connection, then it means that you can extend blackness to every area. And that is the reason why you have life on earth. Why you have the diversity and the abundance of life on earth. It is the extension of that truth. And so if you want to create a world of falsehoods, the first thing you do is to try to negate that truth. And that negation is the process of white supremacy. That's why I, I can guarantee you that in the end, white supremacy will kill every single living thing on this planet, including the planet itself. Life itself will die. Because it is based on an ideology that is anti-nature, anti-that sixes, anti-God itself. Because wh who is God? Where does God come from? God is nature. It is the will of God that is implemented as nature. I mean, this is why the ancient black Africans called themselves Chemites. Chem. That's where the word chemistry comes from. Because the original connotation is that chem is black. That's why the people called themselves blackness. They called their land Kemet. They called themselves Kemnu. And that means that the black people, the black land, it wasn't just a description of the color of their skin. There was no racism. Nobody understood anything called racism then because racism is an artificial construct. They were talking about a physics, a physics of blackness that originates from the sun. Now, the modern-day Egyptologists tell you that the reason why they named themselves Chem is because the river now brings in black silt and deposits it on the land, making it fertile. This is the most insidious nonsense. Because you ask them, how come a group of human beings who were obviously very intelligent named themselves after the mud that they step on, the mud underneath their feet? And if that is the case, it must be likely that you can show me some other group of people in the present day or historically, who have named themselves after the mud that they walk on. I mean, go out into the sky and look at, look at the entire universe as it expands into infinity. What do you think is going on? 
Where do you think you are? What do you think all of this is? I wrote the five principles of organized complex to bring this truth and truth with evidence so that whichever way you turn it, the evidence stands because the nature of truth is that it doesn't matter which angle you're looking at it from. It doesn't matter where you're looking at it from. It stands. It's not going to be overturned tomorrow. You're not going to discover something that's going to throw it all away and then you start again. That's not the way this works. If you think that's the way knowledge is, you haven't really understood it. That is a feature of the method that is based on what? Assuming ignorance. Okay? Now, the reason for this detour into the nature of truth, and you can see that truth often sounds like a taboo. Truth often sounds like something that everybody shies away from and runs away from. But that is the essential dignity of the moon in Leo. It is the nature of the essential mission to find a truth that is so deep that you can connect with the nature of divine significance. Because Leo is the search for self-significance. And it's not the self-significance that comes from things and, you know, objects. It is a sense of self-significance that emanates from deep within because it is tied to the ego itself. That is the nature of the mission. It is a search for the deepest possible meaning. And that meaning must connect to the life of the individual. That you must feel like you're on a mission. And the mission itself can now be described as the divine right of kings and queens. To make the world a better place. To change the reality of the world towards truth. To have a significant impact in the direction of the world. And the world doesn't have to be the wider world. It could be the sphere of the domain of your own personal influence. And so the Moon in Leo character has a responsibility to stand for truth, no matter what it is and no matter the consequences. That's what makes them very powerful people, as we are going to see in this conversation. You can summarize the Moon's placement in Leo. You can summarize it to one thing. Will you accept this mission? Very succinctly, it is the acceptance of a mission. So when you have a moon in Leo, that's exactly what it's saying in your natal chart. Will you accept the mission? Now, you have to go to other places in the natal chart to look for what that mission is. But the mission is such that once you have accepted it and you manage to deliver on that mission, then that's where you get your greatest sense of self-significance. Because you have accepted yourself in a way that generates a powerful truth that births a new you. The type of you that feels deep inside itself the reason for its own existence. That's the nature of self-significance and self-importance. Okay? So that's what the moon in Leo is. But we're going to arrive at that you know, conclusion by following the, the breadcrumbs. Because what does the moon mean? Most traditional astrologers will just tell you that the moon represents your emotions and the way you feel and all that. We don't do that here. Now that's not a a buzzkill for other astrologers. I respect what they do. But here, that's not what we do. You have a choice to do what you do, whichever way you do it. And the only reason why we don't do that here is because I cannot accept that. I cannot accept an explanation that is based on just take it on faith. Take it because I said so. All right? Now, the moon is one of the luminaries we have in the sky. But illumination of the moon is not direct, it's indirect. The moon is actually some type of reflector. And that's because the sun blazes in the sky. The sun is extremely powerful and the energy output of the sun dwarfs anything else in our sky by a lot. All right. The sun is a star and like all the other stars, it's a huge energy producing unit. But that's not the only thing that it does. All right. The sun is representative of exactly the type of life that emerges on earth and the sun does this by being an energy source now if the sun didn't exist even though all the materials for potential life are on earth there would be no activation everything would remain in stasis because in order for activation to occur and for life to generate you need chemistry and chemistry simply means that things are moving energy is moving from one place to another 
So you need the ability to transport things and you need the energy to be able to transport those things. Now, the ability to transport things from one point to another, that's what water does. Water is the primary hydrolyzing agent for all life on Earth. There's a reason for that. It's found in the molecular structure of water. All right. And so nature uses water as a transport system, amongst other things. It also uses it as a reducer, you know, in terms of providing uh, protons, because when you split water into two, you get hydrogen and oxygen. But the primary driver, the primary engine, is the sun. The heat and the warmth from the sun and the radiation from the sun, and also subatomic particles from the sun, because some people just think that that the sun just gives off light and all that. No, the sun is constantly bombarding the entire solar system with radioactive particles. I mean, we have three types of radioactive particles. We have alpha rays, beta rays, and gamma rays. And the most dangerous ones are gamma rays. So the sun doesn't really give off that much gamma rays. If it did, it would sterilize a lot of things on the planet, but life would still find a way. And we know this because when we go to the failed nuclear reactor at Chernobyl in Ukraine, right? You know, in the 80s, the reactor exploded and spilled radioactive contaminants all over the place and polluted a wide area. Now, the primary emission from those failed nuclear reactors, they're gamma rays, they're ionizing radiation. They're very dangerous because ionizing radiation, gamma rays, they're very small and they're like firing bullets at your DNA and many parts of your tissue. They basically break down the organization that life depends on. So when you expose them for a long amount of time, they kill you. Now, when you get to that reactor, right, the innermost part of the reactor, the, uh, the radiation is so deadly and so damaging that w without protection, if you spend anything above five minutes there or less even, you're dead. There's nothing in science that, that is known today that can save you once you've absorbed that type of radiation. You just break down from the inside. There's something living there. There's something growing there. It's living there. It's growing there. It's thriving there. Do you know what it is? It's a fungus. A very special type of fungus called, I mean, science calls it a radiotrophic fungus. And radio simply means that it's a fungus that is utilizing light, but not light as in the normal way we know it. Radiation, intense radiation. It is growing on that reactor. It grows towards the reactor, towards the part where no, no living thing can, can stay in because it would damage it. The fungus is growing there in large quantities and it's feeding on the radiation. It's using the gamma rays, right? to feel its own biochemistry. And as such, it grows large and grows bigger. Do you know the unique thing about that fungus? You know what makes it able to do that? It's very black. It's co completely covered from head to toe with melanins. It's the sixes. Do you know why? Because nature uses the sixes to connect things together. Connection is life. That's why Africa has so much abundant biodiversity of life. That's why life arose in Africa. It's not because of anything anybody said. It's the physics of it. And it is very hard to continue to have these types of conversations with people who are so close-minded, who deliberately ignore the truth in front of their eyes in favor of falsehoods, in favor of a lie. And the reason why I'm telling this story is because we have to understand the nature of Leo. Leo is the sun. The essence of the sun is that energy output, those rays, those radioactive rays. Because without it, we couldn't survive here. The life on earth has adapted to survive under this star that we have and we call our sun. Any life form that cannot do that, the sun eliminates it from existence. So in that way, the sun represents an order, an instruction, an order, a decree that cannot be bargained with. You can only comply. The way you choose to comply is you must respond with blackness. And that means that you must respond with truth. That's it. That's the decree. And in that decree, nobody, nothing has a say. You cannot debate with the sun. You cannot argue with it. 
It's literally the overseer of all life in this part of the universe. And it's that way because it's been made that way. So the one who actually made the sun and made the sun behave in the way that it, it behaves is the one whose decree and whose will is that sun. So when the sun enforces the type of life on earth, it is enforcing the decree of the one that made it. This is why astrology tells you that Leo has to do with the ego and the will. It's not based on somebody saying so. It is the physics of it. And the only way you know the physics is to really, really do the work. You have to go in. That's why I teach this thing in my classes. My classes are meant for people who want to understand astrology, but from a different perspective. They're not content with uh, the sun represents our will and that's it. Let's just take it like that. No, yes, okay, it represents the will, but what type of will? Where is it coming from? How does that change depending on how, where the sun is located in the natal chart? How do we interpret this? Admittedly, the lectures are not for everybody. Because not everybody wants that level of detail. Not everybody needs that level of detail. Some people are just okay with the surface level of it. That's fine. But it means that this is not your cup of tea. Now, the unique thing about people who seek wisdom from astrology is that it's not a mainstream thing. So naturally, you must be curious. And you are curious in a way that is different from the curiosity of a lot of people on Earth. That's what makes the person who seeks wisdom from astrology stand out. You're curious in a way that you are not afraid of investigating things beyond the normal. You're happy to let that so-called abnormality sit within you because you are drawn towards something. Now, knowledge is not outside of you. For you to know something, you must be able to connect with it. And when you know something, you connect with it in such a way that the more you connect with it, the more you know of that thing. By the time you have thoroughly mastered that thing, then that thing is no longer separate from you. It is you. And that is the way we understand things. We represent reality in our heads. Now, when we can represent what we think reality is as accurately as possible, then our plans regarding reality work. Because the representation means that we know what is going on and we can extend what is going on to the rest of reality and that's the nature of truth and when we don't then plans don't work and things break down and it is in that sense that we understand this umbrella type of behavior of the sun as it covers everything it is a will that is domineering it is the archetype of the king or the queen who does not answer to anyone who does not need the input of anyone who cannot be reasoned with, bargained with, or whatever. But you see, Leo is just one of the archetypes in this 12-stage drama. So, the idea of Leo is to understand this motive that causes through you when you have significant placements in Leo. Because that's where you exhibit these qualities, these personality traits. You're more likely not to listen to anyone. You're more likely to go your own way you're more likely to seek your own path forward. Because it's not arrogance, unlike what most people will tell you. It's only arrogance when you begin to fail. What Leo is really looking for is not to be king or to be a queen. What Leo is really looking for is their own self-significance. And they're not looking for it based on what somebody says. They're looking for it based on a cosmic reference, the reference from God. And that is the nature of the mission. Because until that life mission is found out, the Leonine personality is not satisfied. Because the mission appears in the psyche in the form of a task. I need to do this. But it's not being done because of money. Because like I told you, Money is a narrative that human beings invented. Nature doesn't code for money. <laughs> Nature doesn't know what money is. Money is a story people tell themselves. So the Leonine personality does not do things because of money or, or because of reward or whatever. They do it because they're trying to catch a glimpse of who they really are. 
so as to be able to intuit the idea of that mission. And the reason is because they want to be able to connect that mission to a divine purpose. You know, there's something called the divine right of kings and queens. Where do you think it comes from? And then you see kings and queens, they always have a crown on their head. Well, what, 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 what is this? What, have you ever looked at the sun? You know, when you look at the sun, you can get a, a picture of the sun that, you know, that has been dialed down extensively because otherwise the, the sun is white, literally. Yet it's close to a perfect black body. Now, I'm not going to go into what that means. If you want to really understand it, then you have to go do the work. All right, black body radiation. The, the sun, even though it looks totally white, is close to being a perfect black body like most radiating sources in the universe. Okay, but if you look at the sun, if you look at an image from the sun, maybe an image by NASA and all that, there are two bands. There are two narrow bands that circumference the entire sun. They're parallel to each other. So there's a band in the northern part of the sun, close to the northern hemisphere, and there's a band in the southern part of the sun, close to the southern hemisphere. Around those bands is where you have all your sunspots, your solar flares, and all that. It looks like a crown. Don't take my word for it. Go Google it. Go have a look. Then outside of, the, of that, the sun has what is called a corona. And if you see the images of the sun during a total solar eclipse, that's when you can see the corona. The corona is much hotter than the surface of the sun. In fact, sometimes it gets to about a couple of millions of degrees. But it's the outer gaseous environment of the sun because the sun is constantly throwing out a solar wind. Just like you have wind on earth, you have a gust gushing out of the sun every minute, every second, pouring out into space. Now, the magnetic field of the earth protects most of the earth from that radiation. Although people who live on the poles of the earth, they get a significant dose of this radiation. That's why when you go to those places close to earth's poles, right, the northern and the southern pole, right, most of the organisms that live there, thrive there, they are very melanated, very black. <laughs> Most people don't know this. Without it, that radiation will kill them. Because the way the magnetic field of the Earth protects the Earth, right, it funnels that radiation into the northern and the... Because that's the dipole axis of that magnetic field, you know? That's really what it is. The sun is also responsible for the type of consciousness that emerges on Earth. Now, there is no guarantee that Earth with the interaction with the sun over geological time or evolutionary time is going to evolve a self-aware being, all right? Because it requires that sun to act properly and be stable. It's a complex dynamics. But the idea of organized complexity is that to be able to understand how simplicity emerges from chaos in a reliable, predictable way, even though you're dealing with things that are happening over you know, huge geological time scales. Because the real question is, what is it that collapses the chaos? All right, because chaos is easy to generate. It doesn't really require anything, you know, just allow things to just interact all over the place, you know, with different types of rules. All right, and before you know what's happening, you can't understand how anything is behaving anymore. And yet, we see in the universe stable order and patterns. Everything we know is based on the fact that out of these interacting agencies, patterns emerge. And my entire book, The Five Principles of Organized Complexity, details why. Because if you don't understand that, how those patterns emerge, then you don't understand what life is. And you look at life the way modern science looks at everything today as some type of random collisions of all sorts of nonsensical things. Hmm? You listening to this, you're not here by accident. It may look accidental. Everything may look chaotic. But if the chaotic processes always lead to the same type of outcomes, then you got to stop looking at that kind of thing as chaotic. There's intelligence within it. It is the intelligence of blackness. That's my entire point. And you see that blackness in the form of carbon and how carbon weaves trajectories and pathways with itself and with other elements around it. There is an intelligence there that is driven by that carbon. All right? Because you're a carbonated being. Carbon forms the backbone for the flexibility that allows organized complexity. Because what it is, is just mimicking the organized complexity in the environment. And it is using other elements like it in a computational way to process life. That's what biochemistry is. 
Okay? So this has nothing to do with racism. It has nothing to do with what people think skin color is all about. All right? Every star you see in the sky probably has planets around it. So that star itself is indicative of the type of self-awareness that will emerge on that planet if all the conditions are right. A human being will emerge. Now, because it's on another planet, don't think it's not a human being. It is a human being. Every self-aware creature that evolves around any star system in this universe is a human being. Because a human being is not just you looking in the mirror. A human being is the one that possesses self-consciousness and asks themselves, what am I? That's really what it is. That's what humankind is. Because there's a reason why humankind asks themselves that question. What am I? Who am I? And this is a significant question where Leo is concerned. Who am I? What am I here to do? And as long as Leo does not connect to a purpose that is so deep, so lofty and so elevating, Leo is not happy. They always feel like something is missing. And if they don't have that type of divine right of kings or queens, then they will create it with themselves. That's why they create drama. That's why they want to be the center of attention. That's why they may sound bombastic. That's why they may sound arrogant and all that. It has nothing to do with that. Deep within that person, they are looking for a significance that truly is the divine right of kings and queens. You have to understand that to understand the personality type. So the type of self-consciousness that our star, our sun, allows is what you see when you look in the mirror. We live in a very unique type of environment <laughs> on earth. It's a magical place. It's just that most people don't really appreciate what this magic is. We have a sun in the sky that's moderately well behaved, all right, such that we can exist in what looks like, you know, a paradise on earth, really. Now, it hasn't always been like that. Most people don't realize that the environment wherein which life formed on earth looked nothing like the environment as it is today. For one thing, there was no oxygen on the earth. That's really what it is. That's the environment life evolved in. The oxygen came later from algae, you know, <laughs> because for a long time, they were the only things and all these unicellular creatures, they were the only things around. And they produced all the oxygen as a result of photosynthesis. And the oxygen now allowed much larger creatures to evolve. But that's the sun. The sun provided the energy that drove all of that. Okay. So before the wheel of the sun emerges, it is natural that an alchemical process takes place in the sign of cancer. And that alchemical process, the result of it is self-acceptance. And self-acceptance is something that is transactional. So it emerges in degrees. So the degree with which you accept yourself is the degree with which you are able to become that sun in Leo. When one fails, the other fails. Because obviously the sign of cancer precedes the sign of Leo. We look at the moon. The moon receives its light reflected from the sun. So the moon is not a primary emitter. And yet its warm glow, its warm, cool glow is indicative of a constancy. That's why most people are, have different types of emotions when they look at the full moon. It's not like looking at the full sun. The full moon has an allure to it. There's a mesmerizing allure that we experience as human beings when we look at the moon. Now, if you've been listening to my podcast on the lunar series, and you know, I've talked about the moon extensively, but in a nutshell, the moon represents the nature of self-acceptance. It represents where we are looking for that aspect of ourself that we can embrace totally, unconditionally. For it is that unconditional acceptance that births the ego, the sun. Now, we've been looking at the moon for a very long time. Self-awareness in a human being is not something that has always been. It emerged a while ago as an innovation because our brains have become complex enough to generate it. And when I mean complex, I mean organized complexity. My podcast on Sun conjunct Pluto talks about how this emerges, how this self-consciousness emerges. But, it, you know, I cannot be extremely deep 
for that you'd have to read my book my book details how these things happen but in the podcast i have to be sort of peripheral on surface level okay now the moon has always been with us even when we were not conscious we've always looked at it so in a sense the moon represents something very ancient in human nature it represents the journey towards our self-awareness it's very old but that self-awareness could not have been achieved without that moon and the self-acceptance itself could not have been generated without mind because what are we trying to accept in ourselves we're trying to accept all that we are we are birthed in aries we realize that we are sensory beings in taurus that creates gemini through a process i'm not going to talk about here and then gemini needs to create the sign of cancer and so those threads that come all the way from gemini they are the things that we are gazing upon they are the things that we're trying to accept and they're very mental things they are stirrings and what we're trying to do is to internalize those stirrings to the point where they become extremely familiar it is that sense of familiarity that allows us to begin to accept the reality in front of our eyes because we are not separate from that reality we are the reality and this is how you have the marriage between the moon and the sun which is what the moon in leo is really talking about it's the sun and the moon or the moon and the sun whichever way you like it but the ancient people referred to it as sol and mon because sol is the latin word for the sun so when you put it together you have sol and mon you ring a bell but that's really what it is it is a unity between the unconscious side of the human and their conscious blazing mind their will and when those two things come together the sense of a divine mission is extremely powerful within the individual you are convinced that you are here for a reason and nobody can convince you otherwise you will search for that reason instinctively in fact the way that you choose the things that you attach yourself to they are dependent on that divine right of kings and queens and it's not necessarily the fact that you have a crown on your head or etc etc it's that you want to be attached to a purpose a purpose that is so high and lofty that you can catch glimpses of the highest forms of yourself in those things that's why leo creates they create narrative remember what i told you that narratives are the softwares that run self consciousness there's a reason why it's because of leo so leo is a master storyteller they invent narrative you can see this very early in your child when they are learning to play at some point as they're growing up they're learning about the environment they learn how to play how to you know watch them playing they're playing on their own with their toys and they create an entire reality that's the birth of leo it is the will that is coming into existence and it wants to catch a glimpse of itself because nothing delights that will than to catch a glimpse of itself every time it does that the reward is joy a tremendous amount of joy and that's what builds self confidence because it is the evidence of a mirror demonstrating that you actually exist and that you exist in a reality that you can impress upon according to your own likeness and your own image that needs to be tested in the world and that means that leo must evolve it cannot stay on its own if it could it would be perfect it's the perfect sign it doesn't really need anything from anyone yes you can tell it how wonderful it is and blah 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 but that's a temporary measure for leo because until leo is able to connect with a divine purpose and when i mean a divine purpose i mean a purpose that is not mundane it's the archetype of the hero you know when you watch a movie and you see a hero in a movie going to save the day that is leo it's funny that it's within narratives that we find these things but that's what it is leo is a narrative and the more the narrative is connected to loftiness the better leo feels about the narrative and because of that 
Leo might struggle with reality sometimes. Because reality can be messy, especially when you have bad faith actors everywhere. Leo attracts an undue amount of envy because it's an energy source. And so those who are down on their energy levels in terms of their psychological energy levels, they see a power source and they want some of it. Of course, the way they try to get it by attaching themselves negatively, you know, enviously and all that is bad, but it doesn't take away the fact that they are energy starved people looking for energy from the sun. So the moon in Leo person is a magnet for attaching those who want to draw power, who want to draw this light from them. Now, some are kind enough to do it in a way that helps Leo to grow in terms of their self-significance. Some others are terrible at this. They just want to suppress or oppress the light of Leo. Well, that's not possible. Like I said, there's a reason why the ancients attached the symbolism of the sun to the sign of Leo. And then attached a lion to that symbolism. A lion is a ferocious beast. The only thing it's afraid of are other lions. Or other big cats like it. Mostly other lions. It is fiercely territorial. Meaning if you come for it, you got to be ready to die. Now, when you add the moon into this mix, then you have a mother who will destroy to protect her litter, her cubs. Ferociously. Have you ever seen the behavior of a lioness protecting her cub? Though that's Leo on a bad day, basically. Most Leos just, they're very comfortable just being, you know, they're very simple in terms of the structure of their personality. Leo is what I call, you know, I actually I got this as a reference from somewhere, from Robert Hand. He describes Leo as the complete psychological profile. It really doesn't need anything. But if it doesn't grow, it remains immature because of the messiness in the world. Because Leo's joy is not just telling you that it is great. Leo wants you too to tell it that it's great, but it knows that in order for you to do that, you have to see that it is great. So Leo is forced to evolve. And what is it evolving towards? It is evolving towards Aquarius. That's why Aquarius sits opposite Leo. So that the Leo Aquarius axis or the Aquarius Leo axis is a very important axis when it comes to that divine right of kings. Because what starts in Leo? finds its conclusion in Aquarius. That's how it's designed. All the signs are like that, basically. It's one of the things I teach when it comes to how to interpret your natal chart. Because these are patterns that are very deep in the chart. And they're, they're all narratives, you understand. And all the narratives need to come together to form one story. But that's Leo in a nutshell. So when you have a moon in Leo placement, you are already a significant person. The only question that remains is, will you accept the significance? Because representing that significance requires that you must learn how to be a natural leader. I'm not talking about a leader that learns how to lead, such as in the journey of Capricorn. I'm talking of someone who is born with the natural instinct to lead. They're born with the natural instinct to be seen. They're born with the natural instincts to command and hold attention. And so you have people who are naturally used to the limelight, even though if their aspects impede in that moon or placements in the fourth house that complicate the story so that the mission now becomes more difficult to accept. But when you have the moon in Leo, the question really is, are you going to accept the mission? The question now becomes, what is the nature of that mission? In fact, that's not even a good way to put it. When you have Moon in Leo, you have already accepted the mission. <laughs> That's really what it is. You've already accepted the mission. The question now becomes, are you going to be able to deliver on the mission? Because the mission is typified by the fact that you must learn how to be a king or a queen. In the true sense of the word, which means that you must be a hero or a heroine in some story where you do battle against the forces of evil so that you can succeed considering that our world is literally manufacturing evil then most moon in leo personalities face the drama of combating evil than they combat evil with their integrity and so maintaining that integrity in the face of great opposition is one of the hallmarks of the moon in leo because unlike the sun in leo which is only activated when your will is activated. You know, the Leo archetype comes into being at the moment the, the objectification of the sun 
is activated, meaning you have a purpose, you have a goal, and then the way you move towards that goal or that purpose is reflective of that will. All right? But the moon in Leo is a more unconscious representative of that thing, meaning that it does not require you to have a will or an objective. You are simply that by doing nothing. And you would know these people because they have very little difficulty looking like they run the whole place. When they speak, they sound like they own the place. When they walk, it feels like the road is paving itself with gold for them. And they do this unconsciously. They're not doing it because they want to. It's because that is the way deep down inside them, at the instinctual level that you have the moon, that's the way they think about themselves. And these are some of the most honest people you would have. Not because there's any particular attachment to honesty and otherwise. It's because that loftiness, that divine right of kings and queens, right? It cannot be soiled. It is not petty. There is an integrity that comes from it because it's a loftiness. So you have people who truly believe that there's something amazing about them and they will not accept any other type of explanation. So don't expect these types of people to be the first people to come forward to apologize to you or to mend the relationship, etc., etc. No. Tongue in cheek. You literally take air from them. You take lights from them. So why should they apologize to you? Of course, this is not the case when the Leonine person has become comfortable in their own divine right of kings and queens. They no longer have to push that will or that ego out there anymore. And that is the journey itself. That's the acceptance of the mission. Do you accept the fact that you are someone significant? Or will you go chasing all around, engaging all things to try to find that mission, to be that mission? Do you accept to stand for truth against whatever falsehood may exist, against whatever forces that may oppose you? Do you promise to be an energy source destined, predetermined to extend truth to all areas and to enforce that truth against whatever that may stand against you? Do you promise to confront ignorance wherever it may be? Do you promise to be as pervasive as the sun? Do you accept this mission? The moon in Leo is the recognition, the self-acceptance that you are already very important. And if you look within you, you will find the divine right of kings and queens. Now, if you are a moon in Leo person, and yet you've experienced uh, difficulties in your reality in terms of finding out your own self-significance, because when you haven't done this, then you're pushing your ego out there. You're really pushing it out there, you know. The reason why that is occurring is because you haven't connected with your own self-significance. And the problem that generates that is that you lack conviction in yourself. Because this thing called conviction is not a belief system. It's not something that you can make up. It's something that sits within you in your seat of conviction as truth because it has satisfied your requirement for evidence. And it is that which births your ego. It is that which feels that sun within you. And once you connect with that, you're going to pull back that ego into yourself. And then you become more effective in the world. That's really what it is. That's how this thing is supposed to work. So that if you're not experiencing that, then there are distortions somewhere in your natal chart that are distorting this perception or this idea of what this moon in Leo is supposed to be. And hence, when you get a reading or a synthesis, you get to understand what those distortions are and the reason for them. Because sometimes, those distortions are deliberate. Now, if you have enjoyed listening to this and you would like to delineate your own natal chart using synthesis, because synthesis is very different from analysis. In synthesis, there are no individual placements per se. This summary of Moon in Leo I have just given you you can't find it sitting alone in the natal chart. It must always be within the context of everything else. And that modifies the narrative. There's some parts that remain the same, but mostly it is all modified. The mission, the sense of mission doesn't change, but it may now be attached to different areas of human experience. But since the moon is a very powerful thing in the natal chart, 
it contributes to the essence of your life story. It's very important. So if you'd like a natal chart synthesis or a reading, you know, my website details are in the video description. You can go to my website and register your interest and make a booking. And uh, my friend who talked about this moon and Leo placement, I hope this helps. You know, she already knows all the details. I'm just, <laughs> she just wants to hear it from me, so it's okay. All right, so I hope this satisfies, puts it on tape so that uh, everything is pretty strong out. Yeah, I did go into a lot of the science and all that, but this is what I do. And I have to restrain myself most times from getting carried away in the physics of it all, in the chemistry of it, and sometimes even in the math of it. Okay? Because that's the only way to understand these things as truth. Otherwise, you know, we could just be making up whatever story that we like and feeding people whatever we like. Hmm? I believe that astrology um, represents a type of understanding that is extremely advanced because there's so many things to achieve. There's so many things to put down before astrological reality can be accepted as fact. That's the work to be done. Otherwise, mainstream scientists just look at it as just, you know, making up things as you go along. And there's good reason for that because, you know, you cannot accept something if you don't really know how it goes. Otherwise, it could be a fraud. You can't really see how it goes. So what's the person saying? Just take it like that. You know, that puts you under the thumb of that person. And when I'm doing a reading for you, it's not so that you can be under my thumb. That gives me too much control over you. And no human being should ever have sovereignty over another. You are your truth. There is nothing you hear in a reading that you don't already know. The problem is, will you accept the mission?